Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to give you a summary tonight of Genesis chapter 1. It will be a summary of Genesis chapter 1. And then hopefully at the end of that, uh, give you the spiritual application of all of Genesis chapter 1. So there will be a summary and then a spiritual application with, some, uh, with a striking fact in the midst of all that. So we'll go a summary, a striking fact, and then a spiritual application. All right? Uh, um, now, let me read verse 29 through 31. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, Genesis 129, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. All right, notice the word meat there. And then in verse 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every creeping thing, or to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So right here what we see is that uh, there's a general statement for a meal that one can eat. In the garden, it was called meat. So the general meal, or a general term for a meal, is meat. So even if you ate an entire uh, veggie platter that had no meat in it at all, in the Garden of Eden, when they weren't eating meat, uh, they would have said, we're eating meat, which means we're having a meal, okay? And that's the, that's the funny thing, is even vegetarians are meat eaters. <laughs> they just don't know it. Because they're meal eaters, they're eating a meal, they're eating what the Bible says is meat. Now again, in Genesis, there was no bloodshed. Right. Until God shed the blood of a lamb to clothe Adam and Eve, we'll get there. And uh, so, no animals died in the making of chapter 1. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isn't that good? And so, Peter should love chapter 1. But yeah. Peter hates chapter 1 because it says, In the beginning, God, and Peter yeah. thinks they came from animals, which yeah. is why they don't eat meat. Oh, okay. The reason why you don't eat meat is if you have health reasons. That's a good reason not yes. to eat meat. If, you just, if your body just can't handle it. Yeah, uh, you don't eat meat if it's going to cause your brother to stumble. You don't eat meat. Yeah. Uh, you don't eat meat if your conscience, for conscience sake. But the Bible says in the last days and perilous times, he talks about um, the latter times, the Spirit speaketh expressly, some shall give heed, the seducing spirit, adoption of devils, God, command to abstain from meat, forbidding to marry. So there's your Catholic Church, they forbid their, uh, their priests to marry, and then they have you abstain from eating meat on Fridays. So you have fish Fridays, so I guess Ew. fish isn't considered a meat technically. Uh, but that's commanding to abstain from meat. That's a Roman Catholic doctrine. That's not a Bible doctrine. Uh, but you know why they want to. You know why they want to get back to the vegetarian diet, don't you? No. It's because they want to go back to the garden. Okay. All these people that want to run around in nude beaches and eat veggies and straws all the time. What well, you know what they want? They want the garden life experience. They want the garden without the God. Yeah. Yeah, amen. You don't get right. you don't get the garden without God. In the oh, beginning, yeah. God created the heaven and the earth, and then he begins to create six days. He's creating a beautiful garden for mankind to live in. Yep. And they uh they don't know that they're naked there. Uh you go to a new beach today, you know you're naked. Oh, yeah. And you know they naked. Yeah. I wish they would know. <laughs> but they don't. Apparently they ain't got mirrors in their house. Anymore. Exactly not. And uh and so but that's what the, the world wants to go back to the garden, but they don't want to go to the God that made the garden. That's the problem with mankind. They think they can do everything their own way without God. And you can't. You can't yeah, do anything right. without God. Without me, he can do nothing. Amen. So anyways, um, hold your finger there. Look at Song of Solomon real quick. Chapter 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 6. But now the world doesn't know why they want... You know, a vegetarian diet, and uh, and why they want to run around, you know, half naked all the time and fully naked all the time. They don't understand it. Uh, God didn't make man to wear clothes. Yeah. Think about that. God didn't make man to wear clothes. Uh, clothes came as a came, clothing came as a result of sin. The Bible says God clothed them. God had to clothe them after they sinned. If you weren't made, mankind, made in the image of God, mankind was not made to wear clothes. And so now you have this thing there, I gave it to you last week, where it says that fine linen is the righteous of the saints, we're clothed in fine linen. Uh, maybe there's something uh, to that that I don't quite understand. If that's talking about eternity, then you're wearing fine linen throughout eternity. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if maybe in eternity past, before God made man and put him on the earth, if maybe that's what they wore, then when God made man, he figures, let's just not let him wear anything. And see how that goes. And then that didn't go so well. So God's going to go back to the fine linen business in eternity. I don't know. But I know that when he made Adam and Eve, he made them not to wear clothes. And um, that's not how you're made today. <laughs> Praise yeah. God. Yeah. You know, the first thing you do when they come out the womb, they, they wrap you up. Yeah. They wrap you in clothing. 
Jesus Christ, when he was born in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lied him in a manger. They wrapped him up. That shows you that man is, is naturally ashamed of a naked body. It, it, it makes a person uncomfortable. I'm going to start preaching on standards. i got to be careful. <laughs> but it makes a person uncomfortable to see other people without enough clothing. Yeah, amen. There's a, something about that. It makes them a little spooked out, especially when we're talking about the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And so man has to fight against his conscience. He has to fight against how God has made man after the guard. He has to fight against that to enjoy those things. Mm -hmm. He really does. His conscience seared with a hot iron, the Bible says in Timothy. Mm -hmm. All right, Song of Solomon chapter 6, verse 2. My beloved has gone down into his garden. This is talking about Solomon, but in type is Jesus Christ. We're the bride and Solomon. Uh, in Song of Solomon, we're the bride and, and he's the bridegroom. Uh, so in type, we're, talk, we're talking about Jesus Christ uh, and the bridegroom here uh, and the bride. All right, my beloved has gone down into his garden to the bed of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. That's a great picture of what it was like with Adam and Eve in the garden. Mm -hmm. You know what God was doing before sin? He was going down into his into His garden. Knows whose garden is. Ain't yeah, your garden. Yeah, yeah. I got a beautiful garden. Peonies came up today. I told you before. As soon as the peonies comes up, that means we're fixing to get a rainstorm. <laughs> they just opened today. But uh, that's not my garden. That's God's oh, garden. Amen. I can't make none of those things grow. It's only God that brings the rain. It's only God that nourishes the soil. It's only, you know how you get peonies? You know what peonies need to open? What? They need these little six-legged or how many legs they got? Six-legged creatures. Ants, what are, they, what are ants got? Six legs. Peonies need ants. Ants eat the flesh off the top of the peonies to be able to, to, be able to open it up. If, if, if uh, peonies don't open, it's because the ants have eaten away yeah. and it gets dried up. And you'll see that peony is still in its enclosed, sort of like a cocoon state. It's all dried up. Wow. But the, the ants, when they get on that thing, God uses the ants, Amen. the black ants, wow. to eat away at the outer layer to open up that beautiful flower. Wow. Now, I can't make an ant eat anything. <laughs> yeah. no. how, do they, how does the ant know to come to my garden, yeah. his garden? Amen. And eat those peonies so I can enjoy the fragrance for a couple days. Yeah, yeah. And I'm telling you, when those things open, they are the most beautiful, oh, sweet smell. Are. I mean, yeah. we're talking about a, a, a most fragrant perfume yeah. is peonies. Amen. Yeah. And I got irises right next to that. I have no idea how the irises open. They look like, you know, some kind of cocoon thing there. Yeah. But um, but this is this is how God spent his time. God made a garden and he would spend time in it. Yeah. You know, that's the... I really got to get off this thing. <laughs> you know, that's the problem with the city. Oh, yeah. It's a... It's a, it's a they say call it a concrete jungle. Yeah. Nobody... I mean, unless you, unless you find a way to have a garden on your rooftop or on your balcony, yeah. there's no flowers. No. All you're getting is the smell of the exhaust back and forth, yeah. the smell of somebody's weed drifting out the window, <laughs> the cigarette <laughs> smell, you know, all that yeah. junk. Yeah, amen. That the world pumps all that pollution that they pump into the air. Yeah. People are they aren't used to, and they get around to a, a, a serene set of where y'all know about a garden, don't you? Yeah. I mean, you know about a garden. Yeah. Yeah. You dread yeah. it. They don't know what to do out there. Yeah, yeah. That peace and quiet, that serenity that's out there. They don't know what to do with that because they're used to all the honking and the <laughs> sirens and the and the yeah. and the hollering and the crying and the wallering and all that stuff. They can't handle being out there in his garden. When God made it, man, he would just go down his garden and just sniff the flowers and yeah, sniff amen. the trees yeah. and eat the fruit. I can't wait till we get back to that. Amen. It's going to be wonderful. Amen. Until then, I'm relying upon the ants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, look at verse 11. I mean, you read all of Song of Solomon, but it's a love story. It is. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a love chapter. It's almost embarrassing to read it sometimes. It makes you blush. Mm -hmm. Song of Solomon chapter 6, verse 11. I went down into the garden of nuts. Now we're talking about, this is uh, California here. <laughs> I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley. So that's your uh, Silicon Valley right there. <laughs> the valley of fruits and nuts. <laughs> right? Okay. See, God's got everything figured out in this Bible. Yeah, uh, I went down to the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. Uh, you wonder you wonder what kind of things were in the garden. There was it looks like there was a pomegranate tree. There were yeah. nut trees or nut bushes or whatever that thing would be. Uh, there's fruits. There's vines. We know there's a vine tree there. It flourished. 
I mean, God dressed that thing beautifully. Yeah. But then he gave it to Adam. Go back to Genesis 1. Then God gave the garden over to Adam and said, Adam, now you have to dress it and keep it, you see. And uh, now I believe I believe Adam did what he's supposed to do. I believe, you know, Adam had to put a whole lot of sweat equity into it because sweat was the result of the fall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We saw that last week. Yeah. And so I don't know how much he, Adam and Eve really had to do. I'm in a perfect environment. Probably things are growing, you know, so lustrously and... Uh, and so beautifully, he's like, Lord, help me cut back, the, you know, how much greenery and how much, you know, pinks and blues and, and whites and yellows are growing up here. Maybe the Lord, you know, knew how to stunt its growth. I don't know. But uh, the Lord said, hey, Adam, you got to dress it and keep it. But he didn't break a sweat doing it. Not like your garden. You're probably out there sweating all day today trying to keep that thing from, you know, overtaking other things there. But all right, now. At the end of the chapter, he says, God saw everything that he had made, so everything in the garden uh, that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So what we find is at the end of the sixth day, God looks back, God looks back at the end of the sixth day over all his creation, everything he had made, and he found it there to be what he says, very good. Now, before this, it was just good. It was just good, except for the, uh, the second day. You notice that in verse 8, God, that's the only day God says was not good. You see that in verse 8? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 8, it's the only day that God says it was not good. So something on, on the second day about um, outer space there, the firmament there, something about the second day was not good. I didn't cover that when we were there, and I'm not going to cover it now. But at the end of the entire thing, he does look back over everything, and he says it's all very good. And that's a blessing. Now, this is a summary of the entire six days of creation. All six days, he looks back and says it's all very good. Even if he didn't call the second day good, at the end of the day, he says it's all very good. All right, now the summary. Just like Jesus Christ summarized the Bible there, look, we can summarize chapter 1 as well. All right, Genesis chapter 1 is not only a history of the original creation, but also a reconstruction following a cataclysmic judgment after Lucifer's fall. We covered that. It pictures the new heaven and new earth that will be created after the great white throne judgment in Revelation 21.1. Revelation 21, Bible 21.1, he says, uh, uh, I saw a new heaven and new earth. So we know that in eternity, God's going to make a new heaven and new earth, just like in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay? So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the end, God's going to create the heaven and the earth. And what happened before the reconstruction is there was a fall of Lucifer, judgment upon the earth, and then God goes to recreating the garden and all that kind of stuff for those six days. Well, what do you get at the end of life or the end of uh, time there? You have the great white throne judgment, mm -hmm. and then God recreating. You're, you're working backwards what God was working forward. You see? You, it's, everything's full circle. So in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Judgment fell. Recreation, garden. Man's fault, blah, 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 6,000 years of history. As we wind down, it's also winding back up. So we go to the rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, thousand-year millennial reign, battle of Gog and Magog, great white throne judgment, Satan is cast in the lake of fire like Lucifer was cast out of heaven, Satan's cast in the lake of fire, then what? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis to Revelation to full circle Genesis, Okay. And so that's how the thing works. There's a circle of a rainbow around God's throne. So it's a full circle. God's working, as he works forward, he's also working backward. Yeah, yeah. It's a wild thing. Yeah. Uh, I, can't, I can't get excited about, the, about that thought enough. All right, now, so Genesis 1-1 is the generation of the original creation. Genesis 1-2, the destruction of the original creation. And we covered all this, I know, just a summary. Genesis 1, 3 through 19 is the renovation of the universe for the heavenly bodies. Genesis 1, 11 through 28 is the regeneration of the earth for the creation and habitation of plant, animal, and human life. So that is the summary of the entire chapter, all right, as far as the, uh, the, the progression of things as they happen. Those are the contents of what you find in Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 31. Now, the characters, there's three main characters, right, in Genesis chapter 1. The very first character you find, look at Genesis chapter 1. The very first character you find is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And what does it say? In the beginning, what? God. God. 
Now we come over to Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. And again, I think you get 26 times the word God shows up in 31 verses. I think that's how it works out. Now look at what you get in verse uh, 26. He says, and God said, watch it, let us make man. So what is that? That's the Godhead. Yes. All right. So you have three main characters that show up in Genesis chapter 1. And uh, these three characters here begin with God. Well, let me just say the Godhead. Okay, the Godhead. All right, so the character is God or the Godhead. And the Godhead is made up of how many characters? Three. three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, you go over to 1 John 5, 7. He talks about uh, the Word, the water, the blood, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's the Godhead. Or as we call it in modern day terms, that's the Trinity. Everything is a Trinity Everything has a three to it. We're not going to get into all that. But uh, you find the Godhead. Now, God singles out a specific portion of the Godhead in verse 2 for your second character. <clears throat> the earth is without form and void, the cataclysmic judgment, darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God. So there's your second character. Now we have the Godhead, which is all three. But now God is going to go from... Big picture of three in one, Godhead, to one entity out of the Godhead, the Spirit of God. Right. Okay? So that is going to be your second main character, the Spirit of God. Now, this will be important when we get to the spiritual application of it all. Okay? So we see the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Then we see the Spirit itself, 1 2. And then look at 127. Genesis 127. Here's the third character. So God created what? Man. Man. That's you and I, as it were. So three main characters in Genesis 1. The Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The Spirit itself, and now man. Those are your three main characters. And of course, in verse 27, male and female made he them. So we understand that the female, we know later on, is going to come out of the man. Right? So it's just called a woman because she came out of the womb of man. So just like you have the Godhead. And Jesus Christ came out of the, Bible says, out of the womb of the Father, right? He issued from the Father, Jesus Christ did. The woman comes out of God, uh, comes out of Adam's womb there. So you see sort of a two-in-one in the husband and wife relationship, and you see a three-in-one in the Godhead relationship, okay? That's why the Bible says that these two become one. one. They shall be one flesh, that's right. So when you come together with the, you know, Opposite sex, their opposite genders come together. That's two becoming one. Okay? Now, if the world could ever get a hold of that, all you need is one more, and then you'll see that there can be a three in one because there's a two in one. Yeah. Well, it's not that complicated. There's not even a four in one, really, unless you want to put us in there and fine, we'll make it four in one. But we're not part of the God. Amen. No, amen. Otherwise, you're going to get some Baptist popes on your hand. You don't want that. So those, those, are the, those are the three main characters. All right. Now, the conclusion. We see in the summary the contents, the characters, the conclusion. This is that an all-wise, all-powerful, loving God formed all things perfect in the beginning. He made man the crowning achievement of his creation, perfect and capable of fellowship with himself, with God, and able to enjoy and govern Eden. That's how God made man. He made, and that's how God made the world. He made everything perfect in his timing. Man, on the last day, was the pinnacle or the crowning achievement of his creation. Because God wanted somebody to fellowship with. He wanted somebody to be in union with. Somebody to walk with in the garden. Somebody to fellowship with. And that's what he says later on. He's going to say, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help me for Adam. Yeah. Now, this begins to really blow your mind because what you know is we know the end of the story. Yeah. We know how it went for Adam and Eve. Yeah. He's going to make a help me for Adam yeah. and she's going to bring him the fruit and he's going to eat the fruit. Yeah. So the help me becomes the hindrance meat, if you will. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But here, go one step further than that. I believe this. Now, you can. this is a Jeff opinion, so you can just throw it out the window as soon as I say it. Ready? I believe God was alone in heaven. Now, if his Father's not only ghost, certainly God is not alone. His Father's not only ghost. 
but he's still God. An almighty, perfect being who had to just cast out one of his best angels in Lucifer. And he's saying, well, now what? Let's make man in our image so we can fellowship with someone that looks like us. Amen. That has no fallen nature attached to it. Because again, you just lost Lucifer and probably a third of the angels. So now God's like, we need to make man to restore what was lost up here. In fact, that's one of the ideas is that, I don't know if this is true or not because it goes into Calvinism a little bit. But there's an idea there that God made man to multiply and replenish the earth because he knew one day he'd have to save mankind to replace all the angels that fell at the beginning of time. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. It is. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. I believe God was alone in heaven. I believe he was lonely. Now, not depressed, right. not discouraged, <laughs> not in solitary confinement, not in sin. He wasn't ever taking medication for his, you know, depression, anything like that. But I believe God was alone in heaven, and he wanted somebody to walk the garden with. Amen. Someone to go down there and smell the roses with. I listen, I like I don't like just going out and smelling the peonies myself. I'm always getting her out of something she's doing important to set, to show her the status of the flowers. Drives her nuts. I believe God was alone, so he said, let's make man in our image. But you know what God knows, being all knowing? Is he knew that his help me, Adam, would sin. And God would have to kick him out of the garden. Yeah. Just like he knew Eve was going to sin and bring the sin to Adam and then Adam was going to sin and then God would have no choice but to kill one of the animals that he had made, innocent lambs, shed its blood to clothe and cover up Adam and Eve's sin and send them out of the garden with broken fellowship. God knew that when he made man. You know what God did anyways? He made you. You know God saved you knowing what a mess you're going to make yes. of Christian Christianity. Yes. Yes. You know God saved you and he knew that you were going to fall and falter at 70 times 7. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. How often should we forgive our brother, Lord? He goes, you know, 7 times. He goes, nay, I say unto you, 70 times 7. If I get the math to write on that, that's 490 times we should be willing to forgive. Mm -hmm. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven. That is killing the most precious thing to you. Just to clothe and cover up a multitude of sins. God knows all that. And he came and died for us anyways. To clothe us in his precious blood. To clothe us in his love and in his fellowship. Even though he knew we would not take full advantage of what he's given to us. And I believe God went through that same thing in the garden there. Almost like it set it up for... Why did he have to go through with his only begotten son? Don't forget, Adam was called the son of God. Yeah. Right. And Adam, uh, God lost the son of God in the garden. Mm. And for a short time on the cross, the father had to turn his back on his only begotten son there on the cross. He says, Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For a short moment of time, God and man in that broken relationship had to turn his back on his only begotten son. Just like in the garden, God had to turn his back on his only begotten son in the garden, Adam, for just a short while, yeah. fellowship was broken. And I'm telling you, anytime you are in sin, unconfessed sin, unrepentant, disobedient, rebellious sin, you are hindering and breaking the fellowship with Almighty God, and you don't have yeah. the closeness that you need with God. And so he's saying, not my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he's saying, my child, my child, why have you forsaken me? Those are the three main characters. That's the conclusion. All wise, all powerful, all knowing, omnipotent, loving God formed all things perfect in the beginning. Made man the crowning achievement of his creation. Perfect, capable of fellowship and able to enjoy and govern Eden. God, God had man working right out of the right out of the shoot. Now here's a striking fact. Not only was Jesus Christ present in creation, being the second member of the Trinity, the Godhead, but creation itself was bound up with Jesus Christ as the Creator. Look at Col hold your finger in Genesis. Look at Colossians chapter one. Not only was Jesus Christ just present, but Jesus Christ was the active Creator of creation. So we'll look at Colossians chapter one. The character within the Godhead that did the creating was the Word. In the beginning 
was the Word. Yes. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Who created the heaven and the earth? Who created the, the, the six days of creation there? It was the Word. Amen. And God said, let there be light. Yes. So who is, it, who is it that's speaking? It's the one that speaks. It's the Word. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before he's known that, he's known as the Word. Amen. The Son of God. The second member of the Godhead. He is the Creator. Not only is he part of creation, but he himself is the Creator. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 15. And this makes sense because we know what he is to you and I, spiritually speaking. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 15. Actually, look at verse, yeah, verse 15. Speaking of Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood. That's got to be Jesus, right? Yeah. Even the forgiveness of sins, that's Jesus. Father, forgive them. Verse 15. Who, that's talking about Jesus. Jesus is, who is the image of the invisible God? Who's the invisible God there? Well, it's the God that you can't see. Most uh, co uh, closely connected to the first member, the Father. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, who? Well, the one who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and, notice, for him. Everything God created was for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning, God created Say, when did God show up? He's always been. Yeah. When did Jesus Christ show up? Well, as the Word, He's always been. He wasn't Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh until He was born of Mary. Right. But in the status of the Godhead, He always existed. Yeah. Okay, He's before all things and by Him all things consist. He's the head of the body of the church in the beginning. Notice the beginning, the beginning, the beginning, the beginning. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? Resurrection. That in all things He might have the preeminence. Watch it. For it pleased the who? The that in him should all fullness dwell. So that's talking about the father-son relationship. So God made everything through his son, the word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter number one. So the million dollar question is who created everything in the six days of creation? The million dollar question. If you ever get it on some sort of, you know, biblical, trivial pursuit. You know, which member of the God had created everything? Well, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. More specifically, it's the Word. Amen. It's the Word. That's why the Bible says um, the Word became the Word, Jesus Christ, became what? Flesh. And dwelt among us. So the Word, in the beginning was the Word. Yeah. That's God the Son, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was made flesh. That's Him becoming man out of Mary's womb. Yeah. That's what that is there. That's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 16, it says God manifests in the flesh. Right. Okay, that's the word manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter number 1, and look at verse number 3. There's a lot of verses on this, but we're just going to look at 2 and then get back over to Genesis. Okay. Hebrews 1, 3, it says, Who, speaking about the Son in verse 2, Who, being the brightness of His glory, and the express image of his person. Actually, we need to back up the verse 2, sorry. It says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So God speaks to us by his Son. Why? Because he's the Word. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. So God the Father appointed the heir of all things to be God the Son. Yeah. Right? Yeah. By whom he appointed heir of all things. By whom also he made the worlds. So God the Father made it, made the world. How? Through the Son. God the Father said, Son, here's what I want you to do. And what the Son did, the same thing he did when he was made flesh. I do always those things. We've read, we've seen, we've preached on it. I do always those things that please him. He said, I came up to do my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. Father, I have lost none except that one that the son of perdition. He says, Father, I've, I've kept thy name. I've kept thy word. i fulfilled the mission. i fulfilled uh, your will. I've done all that you sent me to do. Yeah. Because in the beginning, I was making the worlds. In the end, I'm trying to heal the world by being the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. 
So in the beginning, he was doing those things the Father told him to do. He was obedient from the beginning. Amen. That's the idea. He's the perfect, go back to Genesis, he's the perfect pattern amen. for you and I to follow. Yes, amen. Obedient from the beginning. Always doing those things which please God. But you know what you don't do? Always those things that please God. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and so let me ask you a question, church. What should you do when you don't do those things which are obedient to God? Ask Repent. Ask forgiveness for. Exactly. So it's not that you're going to go through life and you will get victory over things in your life and you'll be more obedient as you grow than you were when you first started out. Very true. But don't ever come to the place where you think you'll always be obedient right. yeah. and you'll never sin because all of a sudden it comes short of the glory of God. Let him that standeth take heed lest he fall. Amen. So when you know you've been disobedient, yeah. when you know you have backed out of what God has asked you or commanded you or charged you to do, that is not a time to stiff neck and get rebellious and argue with God. It is the time to repent because that now is the next thing on God's agenda for you to do. Right. Yes, you came short of doing what he just told you to do, so don't double dip. But do the very next thing that you know you're supposed to do when you didn't do the things you should have done. Amen. I'll never say that again. So hopefully that's on the table. What is it? It's to be obedient by repenting. Amen. Repent. Yes. Amen. Repent, repent, repent. And then what? Move forward by faith. That's right. Amen. And say, okay, Lord. Now, faith is this. Faith is not faith is not just simply knowing what you've done. Faith is not just taking care of what you've done in the present, but faith is knowing that you can move forward into the future. Yeah, amen. Because faith, faith is sometimes things that have been done, and there's sometimes things that are in the present, but more often than not, faith is more about what it lies ahead and moving forward. Faith is knowing that God saved you in the past. Yeah. Faith is knowing that God can save you. Forgive you in the present. Sure, amen. But greater faith is to know that God is still capable and able and uh, approachable yeah. to forgive you in the future. Amen. That's what faith is. Amen. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. And that's our God. He's the life that we now live. We live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. It is a Christ-like faith. What is it? It is always living up to, or trying in our case, living up to the standard that God has set forth. And when we come short of that, we repent and make it right by faith, knowing he's forgiven me now. And if I mess up tomorrow, he'll forgive me tomorrow. Amen. But I'm not angling to mess up. No, I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to, I'm trying, as I learned today, it takes a hundred times to form a habit. I'm trying to be habitual. I'm trying to be a habitual offender when it comes to serving God. <laughs> and trying to break, break bad habits that comes yeah. to serving God. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. That's very true. Yeah. All right, Genesis chapter um, 1 again. And we see in verse 31, God saw everything. So isn't God here looking back for us through the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Moses is penning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. He said, but he wasn't there. No, but God had to have told Moses what to write down. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the Bible talks about Moses as a man she spoke to face to face. Yeah. So God spoke to Moses face to face. Yes, Moses wasn't there. He don't show up to however many thousand years or a couple thousand years later on down the road. I understand all that. But as it pertains to writing it down, God told Moses what he said. Right. And on the day that God looked back and said what he said, what did he say? And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. You know what God did there is God stood there looking back on those six days, watching those whales, right, Brother Mike, watching those whales that the NIV don't got, watching those whales come up out of the ocean there and slap the tail down and, you know, all those, all those uh, you know, uh, sea creatures going in and out of the water there and all the birds flying. He's watching Adam and Eve just in, in perfect harmony and perfect union smell the roses and God's looking back at all that and he's like, man, that's so good. Yeah, amen. That's very good. Yeah. Very good. That's the summary of his life yeah. as we know it. Yeah. What was life like for God before? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I know what life was like for God on these six days because yeah. he tells us that every day, except for the second day, he thought it was a good thing. <laughs> and that last day, he looks back over it all and he says it was very good. So here's the spiritual application. You ready? 
We serve an all-wise, all-powerful, almighty, all-loving God who created you and I perfect in His image on the day of our new birth. On the day that we were born again, we came in contact as Adam and Eve did, as the birds, as the creatures, as the stars, as the sun, as the moon, as the heavens, as the grass, as the trees, as the herb. We came in contact with an all-wise, all-powerful, all-loving, holy God on the day that we were made perfect in His image on the day of being born again. Amen. Now, I don't know what you thought about God before that. Maybe you didn't think a whole lot about God. Maybe you were an atheist. Maybe you were agnostic. Maybe you just were religious, but you didn't know God the way you know God today yeah, because of yeah. the way you met God yeah. on a specific time in your life when you called upon the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> believing His death and His burial and His resurrection would save you on that very day, you got saved by an all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty, holy, all-loving God, and for the first time ever in your life, you were made perfect. Amen. Say, me? You say, you don't know what I did. I don't care what you did. Oh, amen. And quite frankly, to be crude about it, he don't care either what you amen. did. Because he says, your sins, not that you'll forget them, because if you can forget your keys, you can find your keys. Yeah. Yeah. He says, I will remember them no more. Amen. God chooses not to remember your sins. Amen. He didn't simply go, whoops, I lost your sin somewhere. Like I do when I can't find the keys or my sermon or the bulletin. <laughs> he chooses never Amen. to remember Amen. your sins. Yeah. They can't even come into the presence of an almighty mind. They're not allowed back in. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's right. You got to stew on that a little bit. Yeah. Amen. Who you were before you got saved. Amen. It says the ones that I love, the ones that love me the most are usually the ones that I forgave the most. Mm -hmm. The ones that have a hard time loving God the way they're supposed to are those raised in Christians' homes. Wow. Yeah. On the road, missionaries or pastors' kids or evangelist kids, because they grew up in an environment of Christianity all the time. God is always present, shoved down their throat at the time, and they gotta learn to love God outside of the home, outside of their parents, outside of what's been forced on them. Whereas a lot of people that get saved later in life, nobody's ever loved them. Nobody's ever told them about God. They were raised in broken homes. Moms that didn't live up to the standard they were supposed to live up to. Daddies that didn't provide, didn't care, didn't raise, didn't discipline, forsook, forgot, drugs, deadbeats, jerks of the fathers that didn't provide anything for the children and children grow up outside of the home of that kind of stuff there and they wait till God, they find God and when they meet God they finally hear about love for the first time. Amen. Almighty, all powerful, all knowing, infinite love. Amen. What a wonderful thing. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Now the characters that were present in the history of your spiritual regeneration should be you. Amen. <laughs> you didn't get saved if you weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. Nobody can, you know, say a prayer for you, uh -huh. or be baptized for the dead, as the Mormons believe. You know, they have this pool there. And mm -hmm. The reason why I'm so big on genealogy is if you know Uncle Joe wasn't a Mormon, well, we better get baptized for Uncle Joe to make sure we get him out of wherever he's at to get him into wherever we want him to be. Right. <laughs> or they say prayers for the dead. Or they, you know, they put money in the coffers for the dead to get their loved ones yeah. out of what used to be called purgatory. I don't know what they call it anymore. I'll tell you where you were if you didn't get saved is you're in hell this morning, yeah, yeah. this evening. And ain't no amount of prayer, no amount of baptism for the dead can get somebody out of hell once they're there. That's right. That's right. And anybody there tonight would not want you to go. No. Because there's a story of a man in hell, a true story of a man in hell in Luke 16. He goes, I got five brothers. Yeah, number yeah. of death. I got five brothers. The man in hell never said, let me out. Nope. Because he knew he belonged there. Amen. Listen, if you've got moms or dads or brothers or sisters or aunts and uncles or grandmas that are in hell right now, they know they deserve to be there. Amen. Now, you're up here weeping and crying over them because you don't want to see someone you love, a friend, a best friend, a long-lost friend, an enemy even. You don't want to think of them there. But if they're in hell right now, their words would not be, let me out. Their words would not be, I don't belong to be here. 
they know they deserve it. And they wouldn't ask to get out if they could. You know what their number one cry would be? Send the light. The gospel Amen. light. Because that man said to that to that man there, he says, I got five brothers. Go and tell them, yeah. lest they also come to this place of torment. Yeah. The plea of every unsaved man in hell tonight and the lake of fire in eternity will be, go and tell someone that I love about Jesus and give them the gospel so they don't end yeah. up in this horrible place. So you have to be present there for salvation. If you weren't there, you're not saved. Amen. God had to be there. Yeah. All three members. Because yeah. God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. So all three members have to be present at your salvation. And then lastly, the Spirit has to be present because the Spirit is the one that does the wooing and the drawing, what we call the convicting. Right. Yes. And then once you're convicted of your sin, once you realize the, the vile, uh, defiled, uh, 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 reprobate nature of your sin, then that you are going to go to hell for all of eternity. Once you recognize the sinner that you are, then you recognize through the Holy Spirit's convicting you of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. When the Holy Spirit convicts you about that, at that very moment you drop to your knees and you say, Lord Jesus, save me. I know I'm a sinner on my way. You died for me and you rose again to keep me out of this place. Save me. At the moment you pray that prayer in faith, the Holy Spirit's present because he has to be present. The God has present. And they can't go anywhere really without one another. The Holy Spirit does this. 1 Corinthians 12. He baptizes you. 1 Corinthians 12. Into the body of Christ. That's why you see the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. Again, your body is made up of like 80% water. God's always moving in your life. God, Every unsaved person out there, God's moving in some way, shape, or form on them to bring them to salvation. The child of God then, having been baptized, spiritually speaking, not by water, but by blood, the child of God is the crown of the create of, of Jesus Christ's creation and the Holy Ghost regeneration. Titus chapter 3. Actually, turn over there real quick, Titus 3. Let me show you this thing. You see, you understand that when you understand the picture of Genesis chapter 1, the the original creation, the fall, the recreation, the regeneration, the Spirit of God there. You get a beautiful picture that I preached about when we first started Genesis. A beautiful picture of your conversion. A beautiful picture of coming into this world a little baby. Growing up to be a 13-year-old rebellious teenager. Knowing that you deserve hell. And getting born again eventually someday. And then God regenerating you by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Baptizing you into the body of Christ through the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Titus, which is after 2 Timothy there, Titus says this in Titus chapter 3, verse number 4. Or verse 3 says, For we ourselves also were, this is what you were before you got saved. See if you can find yourself in the list. If you can't, then you're not saved. <laughs> Titus 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's who you were mm -hmm. before you got saved. And if you didn't recognize that was your condition, you can't get saved until you realize you're lost. Amen. Nobody is saved unless they first realize that they have a lost condition to be saved out of. Yeah. Nobody is born into salvation. You are born again into salvation. And you have to get born out of these things here, the works of the flesh. The foolish, disobedient, deceitful, malice, hateful things of life. You have to recognize that's who you were. And once you recognize that's who you were, then you can recognize what you need. Yeah, amen. But after that, after what after you recognize you were a sinner on your way to hell. But after that, what shows up? The kindness oh, and love yeah. of God, our Savior, toward yeah. man appeared. Whoa! Now I get you a little excited yeah. because that's what you were. Yeah. And you know that's what you were. I don't care how old you were. I don't care how young you were. You recognize in your flesh, yeah. in your depraved nature, that's what you were. Yeah. And if not for the love of God and the kindness of God appearing to you, Amen. 
A sinless man appearing to a sinful man. God who can't even stand in the presence of sin for a second there stood in your presence saying, will you have me? Will you have me? Arms outstretched to show you how much he loved you. As far as the east is from the west there. Uh, uh, head and feet stretched out to show you from the north to the south. He can save anybody. The kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And then here's what happens if you don't believe that. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. See, it's not your garden. <laughs> it's not your garden. It's his garden. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. Amen. You know why you got saved? Because God had mercy on you. Amen. Now listen, God will have mercy on any sinner that calls out. Amen. It's not like, well, how much do I have to call out before God has mercy? Listen, one sinner yeah. in a plea to God for salvation, an almighty, all-knowing, all-merciful God has mercy on that sinner. Amen. If you want to cry out for extra uh to get to the front of the line of somebody else, by all means, cry the louder. But can I tell you that God's ears aren't stopped up? Yeah. God's ears aren't plugged up like yours and eyes get. God's ears are unclogged ears. And any sinner who knows his sinful condition, who calls upon him by faith, wanting salvation, God who is all merciful, all knowing, all powerful, and all loving, will save that sinner because he doesn't want to put anybody in hell. No, That's right. Man. You think he was there wanting to kick Adam and Eve out of the garden? He didn't want to do that. No, no. But he had to Amen. because law has to be condemned when the condemner uh, breaks that law. So how do he save us? By the washing, well, notice the word, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified, that is just as if I had never sinned, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. You know what Adam and Eve were in the garden? Heirs oh, amen. of eternal life because amen. they had right to the tree of life there. They were heirs according to God's grace. Heirs to all that God had made. If they had kept themselves from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and had eaten of the fruit of the tree of life there, they would have been heirs of eternal life. Mm. Well, okay. yeah. You know what you got when you got saved? You got justified. Yeah. You got all of God's grace. And you, got, uh, you became the heir of eternal life. Yeah. That's what you got. You know what you are? You're the crowning achievement. Yeah. Of his recreation, if you will, and regeneration, if you will. He saved you just like um, he made Adam and Eve. He saved you and made you perfect in his sight. Just like Adam and Eve. Fully capable of fellowship with him. Before you got saved, you could not fellowship with an almighty God. No you could not fellowship with God until you got saved. Right. Any more than Adam and Eve could fellowship with God until he made them. And when he made you just as he made them, he made you with the sole purpose of fellowship. Also, he made you so you could enjoy, sister, as we talked about last week, you could enjoy your salvation. Yeah. You think that Adam and Eve walked around the garden like this? No. <laughs> no, no, no. I think they might have been smiling. Amen, I, I think they might have been skipping through the tours. Yeah, I, bet he was. <laughs> I think they might have been prancing through the prairies, if you will. <laughs> I think they'd have been rolling down the hills of the lilies. Amen. Yeah. I think they would have had a little bit of a of a of a hop, skip, and a jump yeah. to their step, all for that God had given them, uh, when nobody else could give them that. Amen. A Christian should not be miserable. Amen. Now you live in a miserable world. Yeah. But you don't have to be miserable. Think of all the blessings that God has given you in spite of who you are. Right. In spite of what you were. In spite of what the world is throwing on you all the time. God's been more good to you than bad yeah. to you because God's never been bad to you. Amen. Right. Even on days where you think he's being bad to you, let's just say that were true for a second. All the good should far outweigh yeah. any Absolutely. thought of bad. Yeah. You know what the Bible says this? You know how a man gets saved? You ready? The Bible says that the goodness of God yeah. leadeth thee to repentance. Oh, you know that's how you'll get over some of the sins in your life that are besetting sins? You realize how good God is. Yeah. And you get to focus on how good God is. It makes you realize if God's so good, then I should probably honor God like yeah, that. 
I should probably love a God like that. I should probably knock off my foolishness and strive for obedience, strive for righteousness, strive to do things that are pleasing in His sight because He's so good. And when you are in the midst of a besetting sin, it should lead you to repentance and realize how good it is to even forgive you of what you're doing right now. He made you. He saved you perfect in His sight. Fully capable now of fellowship with Him. When we are fellowshipping with Him, we are coming, coming short of what He made us for and to do. We should be able to enjoy and govern our lives under His control of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 6. Not only are you His creature in Christ, but you are bound up in Him as your Creator and Savior. In Him is hid all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. He has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification. We are hid in Christ, and Christ is in us. Therefore, we are wrapped up and bound up in Him. Amen. He is not only our Creator, He is our Savior. Amen. Now here's the thing. You ready? The summary. Yeah. At the end of your life, like at the end of six days of creation, mm -hmm. at the end of your life, what will God say when looking back over the years of your regenerated life? Mm -hmm. Will it be very good or will it be in vain? Mm -hmm. The Bible says He created you not in vain. Right. Amen. He said your labor is not in vain right. in the Lord. Yeah. Listen, I want God to look back. Now, again, we're not going to bat a thousand. But I want God to look back, even if he just says it's good. Mm -hmm. That's better than vain, Jeff. Yeah, amen. I want to have God look back yeah. at the judgment seat of Christ over my life mm. and say, Jeff, amen. it was good. Me too. Well done, thou good and faithful amen. servant. Amen. I don't want to say, you miserable, boring <laughs> loser. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I don't want that up there. No, we do. I want God to look back at the work He did in my life and I want to know that there were moments in my life, times in my life, where I honored Him, I, I pleased Him, I did those things which were pleasing in His sight. The old uh, saint, dear saint of God, once said this, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It'll be very good. Yeah. Let's close with a word of prayer. Steve, Steve why don't you, I'll take a question after, sister. Yeah. Steve, why don't you close this down? I'll get Kay's question there. Lord, I just thank you for the uh, Lord, the scriptures, Lord, that you're able to reveal to us, Lord, Lord, uh, through the Holy Spirit, Lord, Amen. that we're able to see these things, Lord, through the light, but Lord, pray you just minister to us, uh, Lord, Amen. through it, and Lord, help us to not forget it this week, Lord, Amen. to be able to keep our Bible study going, Lord, to be able to see these things openly that you'd have for us, Lord, and I pray you be with people that are traveling, Lord, yeah, not here, or not able to be here, Lord, that want to be, Lord, I pray you just help them, be with them in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Keep uh, Mike and Kathy in yes. prayer still. Um, I haven't heard from them since uh, Monday, but uh, just keep them in prayer. And uh, Miss Kay, you got a question? Uh, I always, uh, yeah, kind of a question. Or, yeah. yeah. So and when, um, you know, when the Lord is saying that uh, He made everything and it was very good, yeah. that's a judgment call, yeah. right? So, and sure. at the end of our life is a judgment. Yes. So that's the good. judgment. Let me see of Christ. Right? For us, the jumpsuit of Christ. That's right. right. That's right. Just, that's good. Yeah. Excellent. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, amen. Yep, it'd be a crown. Yeah. Crowns and silver and gold and precious stones there. Amen. Uh, like cherubs and cherry 